my sorrow and dead in my sin And lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your endless love Pouring down on us You have made us new from my chains I'm a prisoner no more and my shame was a ransom he faithfully bore and he canceled my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested and my life began and oh your grace so free washes over Savior displayed on a criminal's cross And darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand That's when death was arrested in my Man, you can be seated. From Psalm 118, starting in verse 19. Open the gates of righteousness for me, and I will enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the Lord's gate. The righteous will enter through it. I will give thanks to you because you have answered me and have become my salvation. 
The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord. It is wondrous in our sight. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, save us. Lord, please grant us success. He who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God and has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. We're coming into to, to Holy Week, and as we do so, I said, you know, we give thanks, right? This is the day that, that, that they all gave thanks, Hosanna, and called, called out and, 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 and looked to the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. But we know that later that week, that attitude would change. And as we gather today on the Lord's Day, I said, hey, let's remember we're singing praise and give thanks to the Lord. But as we go through this week, let's look at our hearts and, and realize where are the places in our lives where we forget why we give thanks, why we praise him for the work that he's done on the cross. And why did he do that work on the cross? To restore us that we may have a hope of eternal life. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your goodness, for your greatness, for your mercies, and for rescuing us sinners who, 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 who so often find ourselves giving thanks one day and choosing our sin another day. Forgive us where we forget to keep you first in our lives. As we reflect upon this week, let us look to you and give thanks to you each day and remember why we give thanks. And remember that, that, that your demonstration of love to us is something that should floor us each and every day of our lives. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we continue to worship this morning?
goes on and on and on. Where is my God? My salvation is in you, in you. chapter 24, verses 36 through 53. A a powerful passage of scripture as as we end our time in Luke's gospel. And I'm looking forward to sharing this passage with you. So go ahead and find that in your copy of the Bible. Luke 24, verses 36 through 53. If you did not bring a Bible this morning, you should find a Bible in the seat before you down the book rack. Go ahead and grab that Bible if you will. Find Luke 24, verses 36 through 53. If you don't own a Bible, we would love for you to take that Bible home with you and read it and learn about the God that loves you and desires a relationship with you. Uh, if you're new to the Bible, the gospel of Luke is really easy to find. It's the third gospel in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then the gospel of John. We're in Luke 24 verses 36 through 53 this morning. Hey, I don't know if you've ever seen the show or not, but it's a show we like to watch from time to time. Uh, it's an older show called Dirty Jobs. You remember that show, Dirty Jobs? That is such an interesting and entertaining show. And so, you know, Mike Rowe, like he's just an all-American guy and he uh, traveled around the country and he, he he's seeks out people who do these strange and dirty jobs. I don't know what episodes you've seen. We haven't seen all of them, but we're trying to make our way through them because it's just fascinating to me to watch where he goes and the people he interacts with. And, and one of my favorite episodes, and I, I know this probably shouldn't be my favorite episode, but we're, the episode where the dirty job is a deer urine farmer. I didn't know that, I know that that's actually a thing. I know that sounds really weird, doesn't it? But can you imagine that being your job? Like, that's terrible. At any rate, I, I read an article this week. If you're looking for a job, maybe you're looking for a dirty job, I've got one for you. And so I don't know if any of you are interested in moving to Antarctica, uh, but there is a, a job description online now for five months in Antarctica. There's this little area of Antarctica that's actually kind of a tourist destination. It's, it's run by the uh, United Kingdom Heritage Trust, and they have got a couple buildings there. And about 18,000 people a year visit this 
this section of Antarctica by cruise ship. And so they're looking for someone to come down there and spend five months, just five months, and they're going to help sort the mail. I don't know how much mail you get in Antarctica, but apparently you get some. And so you'll work in their little post office and sort the mail. Uh, But the big thing they want you to do, now watch this, because this is very, very critical, I guess, for the success of Antarctica. Uh, One of the big things they want you to do in Antarctica, if you come work this job for five months, is they want you to count the penguins. I mean, you gotta know how many penguins there are, right? And so I don't even know how you do that. Like one, two, and you lose count, you have to start over. That sounds like it would take five months to do. So you go down there and you spend five months and count the penguins. There's a couple downsides to the job. One of the downsides is, you know this, it's cold. The average temperature is cold. And so you'll be cold while you're there. And, and because it's Antarctica, uh, there is no running water. So you'll have five months with no running water whatsoever. And there's also no internet service whatsoever. So you can't use your cell phone. Call. And if you get sick, you're going to be in trouble because it could take up, a, up to a week for them to actually get you out of there. And so that's the job, right? It is a tough job. And so you think about jobs like that, whether it's micro and dirty jobs or whether it's going to Antarctica and spending five months counting the penguins. I don't know if you would consider those jobs, jobs that would be, you know, just a top of level kind of, this is what I want to do in my life. They don't sound like the kinds of jobs that would give you an abundant life. And here you are in this room this morning and that's what we all want. We all want an abundant life. Life, And we hope that our career path uh, will give us an abundant life. We hope that our family will give us an abundant life. We hope that living in the right country in the right time will give us an abundant life. We all want an abundant life. And, And you're like me. You've been around long enough to know that there are many times in life that life doesn't seem so abundant. If we're really honest, now come on, if we're really honest this morning, there are lots of times in life that life seems downright miserable. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has come not to give you a miserable life. Jesus really has come to give you an abundant life. In fact, this is what we've discovered in Luke's gospel. In Luke's gospel, what we have discovered is is abundant life. It really is knowing Jesus. Abundant life is Jesus. In fact, you know what the apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter one, verse 21. He says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. The apostle Paul discovered in his life that abundant life, it really is Jesus. And so here we are at the end of Luke's gospel and, and, and it's, a, it's a fitting conclusion to the gospel. Jesus in this passage is going to appear to his disciples and he's going to ascend back to the Father. And as he appears to his disciples and ascends to the Father, I think in this passage, we are given some reminders about the abundant life that Jesus has given us. And so I wanna just in this passage this morning, just show you three truths about the abundant life that you have in Christ Jesus, your Lord. So take your Bibles, look with me if you will, at Luke chapter 24. Go ahead and rise to your feet as we honor the ring of God's word. We're starting in verse 36. We're going down to verse 53. Listen to what the Bible says. As they were saying these things, Jesus himself stood in their midst. He said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Why are you troubled? Jesus asked them. And why do you, why Do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you can see I have. Having said this, Jesus showed them his hands and feet, but while they were still amazed and in disbelief because of their joy, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He told them, These are my words that spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look, I am sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. 
Then Jesus led them out to the vicinity of Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. And worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and they were continually in the temple praising God. Father, thank you for this morning and thank you uh, for the journey we've had over these last 15 months to walk through this beautiful gospel, to be learning from Jesus our Lord. Thank you that you've given us this opportunity to be reintroduced to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Father, in Christ, we have found abundant life. And I know for maybe all of us in this room, sometimes life doesn't feel abundant at all. And so would you please remind us this morning why life is so abundant in Christ? And Father, for those of us in this room this morning who might be struggling, I pray that you would lift our heads that you would encourage us by your spirit, that you would give us hope in the midst of some of our pain this morning, that you would remind us that the best life we can live is a life centered on the promises of Jesus Christ. And so Father, as you're speaking to us this morning, we're gonna listen carefully to what you're saying to us. We're gonna listen with open hearts. We're gonna listen with a desire to obey you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. Now, if you were with us last week, you remember the story that Jesus, he is alive. He's resurrected from the dead and he's making appearances to different followers. And we looked at the story last week of two followers of Jesus, two disciples who leave Jerusalem distressed about what they had witnessed while they were in Jerusalem. And while they're on their way to Emmaus, Jesus appears to them. And we talked last week about how on the road to Emmaus, Jesus walked through the scriptures with these two disciples and showed them how all of the scriptures, all the Old Testament scriptures point to him. And now these two disciples who had this experience with Jesus on the road to Emmaus, they rush back to Jerusalem. And I, I can imagine what it must have been like when these two disciples, uh, they're not a part of the 11, uh, but they are nonetheless two disciples, two followers of Jesus. They come to the 11 and they say, you won't believe what we've seen. We have seen the risen Lord on the road to Emmaus. He came to us and he explained the scriptures to us. And then you come down to verse 36 and it says, as they were saying these things, Jesus himself stood in their midst. Now, this is really interesting. If you think back uh, to the previous verses, once Jesus appeared to those disciples, he went uh, to their home and he shared a meal with them. And the Bible says in the previous verses that Jesus disappeared. And now here you have verse 36, that while these two disciples have now come to Jerusalem and they're with the 11, now Jesus appears. It's really interesting. What we find here at the end of Luke's gospel is Jesus is appearing and disappearing. In fact, in fact, the gospel writer John, when he gives us a description of this event, he tells us that when Jesus appeared to the disciples in this room, that the doors were actually locked. That's not a side note. John wants us to know like Jesus is just making an entrance in a very supernatural kind of way. Here, I think this is what this is supposed to remind us. When Jesus rises from the dead, he has a resurrected body and his resurrected body is different than the body he had before the resurrection. Do you follow me? Now, I don't know what this is supposed to teach us about the resurrection and what your body is going to be like on that day when you are resurrected. But here's what I know about the body of Jesus, right? When Jesus is resurrected, his body is not limited by this earth. You follow? Like, it's different. I don't know what all that means. Scripture doesn't tell us what all that means. But, but it is pointing to a reality that resurrected bodies are different. And someday when the trump sounds and Christ returns and he resurrects the dead, he resurrects us who are in him, our bodies are going to be different. Now, I don't know if that means you're going to be able to teleport places. I have no idea. But I do know that your resur resurrected body is going to be different because it is going to be unstained by this world from that point on. And that's a glorious truth to think about. But here you have Jesus. He's now with these disciples. He's appeared. And look at what it says. Uh, they were startled and terrified. And you would be too if you'd have witnessed that. Because the doors were locked. Like he just appears. And, and, and what they thought, and you'd have thought the same thing too. They thought, man, he is a 
ghost. But look what takes place. Jesus says, verse 38, why are you troubled? He asked them, why do doubts arise in your heads? And, and, and look, verse 39, look at my hands and my feet. See that it is me, touch me. You probably remember in John's gospel where doubting Thomas said, didn't he? I won't believe. I won't believe that he's alive unless I see the nail scars in his hand and the nail scars in his feet. And in John's gospel, when John records this same event, John says that Jesus said to Thomas, look at me, touch me. Touch where the nails went in. Touch my feet. You see? Like Jesus is assuring his disciples that it's really him. Yes, his body is different. Yes, he's appearing behind locked doors and he's disappearing, all that kind of stuff. But, but it's Jesus in the flesh. In fact, he goes on to say, he says, touch me and see because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you can see I have. He even sits down with them and says, hey, give me something to eat. I'm hungry. Like, uh, give me some fish. I mean, let's eat. And so all of this is to show us that when Jesus resurrects from the dead, he really resurrects from the dead. He's not a ghost floating around. He is a resurrected man and this resurrected man the God man is now there in the presence of his disciples in presence of of Simon Peter in the presence of John in the presence of James in the presence of of all those others that that, that have followed him he's there they can see him they can touch him and and just back up with me if you will you come back to verse 36 as they were saying these things he himself stood in their midst and he said to them now underline this phrase Peace to you. Now, you probably know this, that, that in those days, it was customary when you greeted someone to say, peace to you. It's still customary. If you travel with me uh, to Israel in 2025 and, and you travel with me to that place and we go to different places around Israel, you're gonna hear over and over again this word, shalom, peace, shalom. It's a customary greeting. But can I just propose to you that on this particular day, when Jesus appears to the 11 behind locked doors, when he says, peace to you, it is much more than a customary greeting. Because on that day, do you know what those disciples lacked? On that day, those disciples lacked peace. You think about everything they had witnessed and everything they experienced, how, how they had been there when Jesus was arrested and then fled and, and then they knew of his crucifixion and, and how he was beaten and then nailed to a cross. I mean, it was absolutely chaotic. But on this particular day, when Jesus appears to them, he says that customary phrase that was far more in those moments than a customary phrase. He says, peace to you. Because that's what the death and resurrection of Jesus gives to all of us. Peace. Real peace. And, and I don't know when you hear that word, what you think about, but so many of us, when we hear that word peace, we think about, man, that's really what I want. Like I want peace. And, and probably if you're like most people, the way that you define peace is, is peace is nothing more than the absence of unpleasant circumstances. But in God's economy, peace is far more than the absence of unpleasant circumstances. Shalom, peace. Peace is when all is well with your soul in spite of the circumstances. We talk about this all the time, don't we? That if you were a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, you have peace with God. You are in a right relationship with him. You never have to fear the God of all creation condemning you to hell. You have peace with God because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, because you have the peace, because you have peace with God, you also have what? The peace of God, right? Because no matter what happens in your life, good, bad, or ugly, nothing can take away what you have with God. And so because you have peace with God, you have the peace of God. This is why the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, right? I rejoice in all circumstances. This is why he talks about, I give thanks for everything. 
and, and, and how he talks about the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And you've been in those situations, haven't you? If you're a follower of Jesus, you've been in those dark circumstances. You've been in those trying times. You've been in those difficult days. But in those difficult days, you don't know how to explain it other than the fact that in those difficult moments, you had this overwhelming sense of the peace of God. And you had that overwhelming sense of the peace of God in those dark days because you have peace with God. You know that since all is well in your relationship with God, all is well with your soul, that no matter what you go through, you can have that peace. And so for followers of Jesus, peace is far more than the absence of unpleasant circumstances. Peace is knowledge. It's knowing that God is in control of every situation and he's always at work for his glory and your good, even in the unpleasant circumstances. This is why the apostle Paul says in Colossians 3.15, I love this. Listen to what he says. He says in Colossians 3.15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Because every day you can make a conscious decision to let the peace of God rule, right? Or let the troubles and trials rule. And Paul says, hey, listen, let the peace of God rule and reign in your heart. So I want you to stop right here because I want you to see this truth. Abundant life, abundant life, like that's what we desire. Here's why life with Christ is abundant because you can have real Peace. Now, I know we talk about this a lot, but just think about it with me. You can have real peace. If this is true, if you can have real peace, then, then you and I, we need to quit saying, my life will be at peace when. You understand what I'm saying? Because we all have a tendency to do this. We all have a tendency to look at our circumstances, whatever they may be, and see the hardships and see the struggles and say, my life will be at peace when? My life will be at peace when I finally get out of debt. My life will be at peace when we finally get over these hurdles in our marriage. My life will be at peace when I finally get out of school and get a real job. My life will be at peace when whatever. And so you have an end date in mind. You see what I'm saying? Like you have a destination in mind, a goal in mind that when I get through this, when I have this much money in the bank, when this happens or that happens, then I will be at peace. And so until you get to that point, right, you're not at peace. Every day's a struggle. Every day's a stressor. Every day's a worry because you're not at that place yet where you've gotten past the circumstances you want to get past. And so what happens, now watch this, you'll end up, because you think peace is a destination, you'll end up making some bad choices to hurry through the problems. You ever done that? You so badly want to get to the other side of the hurt, the pain, the difficult circumstances that you'll even make sinful choices in your attempt to get to the other side. But I just want to remind you, peace is not a destination. Peace is your present reality based on the past, what Christ has done for you and based on your future hope knowing that Christ is going to return for you and take you home to be with him. So peace is your present reality based on the past and based on the future. And so because you know what Christ has done in the past and because you know what Christ is going to do in the future, right now in your present reality, regardless of the circumstances, you live at peace. You follow? Peace isn't a destination. Peace is what you have right now. And so instead of saying, my life will be at peace when, I need to learn to say, my life is at peace because, because of what Christ has done for me, because the spirit of God lives within me, because of who God is, I'm at peace right now. Because nothing changes what God's done in your life and nothing changes what God's going to do in your life. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a big fan of, of hamburgers and, and fries. Like, I mean, whatever. We can go to a gourmet restaurant or we can go to the Five Guys and get a burger and fries and really eat. You know what I'm saying? Like, I love to find a good burger and fries. And so I don't know if you do this or not, but I kind of rank, 
you know, restaurants and rank, especially burger places, because there's different categories of burger places. Like there's the kind of burger places where you go, where you sit down and they bring a menu out to you and you order off the menu. Like, no, that's not a real burger place because it's too expensive, right? And then you have another tier of burger places. I'll classify like five guys, you know, you have five guys and you think about Comeback Shack and, and maybe Culver's would creep in there. Like uh, that, that's a level of burger. Like that's the kind of burger like I typically prefer like Five Guys or Culver's or Comeback Shack. We like those places. And then under that, you have the next level of burger places. And those are the ones we all try to avoid. McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, you know. And then under that, you have like the bottom of the rung, right? I don't know how much more bottom you get, but you have like, I don't know, cookout, you know, rallies, crystal. Like, and so I have this system of ranking burger places, right? So, so I'll, I'll be honest with you, like in that middle tier, like the, the, the um, Burger King, the McDonald's, the Wendy's, my favorite one, I'll show you what my favorite one is. My favorite one is Wendy's. Come on, I heard you. Some of you said amen to that because like out of that, out of that second tier, like if it's between McDonald's, Burger King and Wendy's, like Wendy's wins every single day. There's something about that square patty that's just really, really good. Now, I don't know if you saw this or not. Just hang with me. Um, about a month ago, Wendy's made a decision. Their menus are going all digital. So you'll walk into Wendy's and you'll see the, the menu item and the price on it. And, and this was the decision they made that the price, did you see this? The price of the item is going to fluctuate as the day goes on. They've got a really special name for it. It's called dynamic pricing, right? So if you go to Wendy's at lunchtime, that four for four is now 10 for 10, right? Like it's, it's, they jack the price. It wouldn't be 10 for 10, it'd be four for 10 or probably two for 10. I have no idea. But anyway, they jack the price way up. And, and then, right, later in the day when, when there's not as many people, they bring the price back down. So I don't know how it's gonna work, but can you imagine like you're staying there and you just order your four for four and like all of a sudden as you're ordering it, the dynamic pricing changes. And now it's $10. You're like, what in the world's going on here? But that's the way they've chosen to operate. Now, Obviously, that's created quite a stink because nobody wants to go to Wendy's at lunchtime and see that their four for four is now four for 25, right? And so, so all this backlash has taken place. And so now they're coming out and saying, well, we really didn't mean it. And they're going back on their word. They're trying to change what they say because none of us are gonna go to Wendy's if our four for four is gonna go, go up to four for 25. You follow what I'm saying, right? Like we're not gonna go there anymore. And so they're trying to backlash because of the customers are saying, hey, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. They're constantly changing their word. Now, I tell you all that to tell you this. I need you to remember this, and I need to remember this, that you serve a God who never changes his word. And his plan isn't going to change. Like there's not gonna be a moment that the God of all creation says to us, hey, I told you I'd give you peace, but I think I've changed my mind on that. Right Now, if you want peace now, you've got to do these things or jump through these hoops. No, God has promised you peace in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that promise is good for eternity. The peace of God for you is not going to change. And so therefore, peace to you. You can walk in it, but we've got to move faster. Look at what the text says. You come on down. And, and Jesus says, peace to you. But I love what takes place. Verse 44, he told them, these are my words that spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So you remember on the road to Emmaus, Jesus stops and talks to those two disciples. And to those two disciples, he begins to explain to them how the Hebrew Bible, your Old Testament, tells the story of the Messiah and how the Messiah would suffer and die and rise again. Now, Jesus is going to do, this, to do the same thing with the 11. He's going to remind them how the Old Testament scriptures point to him. But I want you to see something. Verse 45, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day. Now, listen, and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, just underline that phrase to all the nations. I don't know if you know this or not, but the end of Luke's gospel and the end of Matthew's gospel give us 
what we call a great commission. That Jesus is going to ascend. He's going to leave the earth, but he's going to leave the earth giving the disciples a command. You're my witnesses. Go into the earth and spread the gospel. Make disciples. In other words, right, he's going to leave them with purpose. Now, you've been a part of a Baptist church long enough to hear a Baptist pastor talk about the Great Commission because Baptist pastors love to, and rightly so, we should love to talk about the Great Commission. But I want to put it in the context of what Jesus is doing here. Now, follow me. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Jesus takes them back to the Hebrew scriptures. Look how I am the fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures. Now he does it again. Are you following me? He does it again with the 11. But this time, right, he says, for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but you need to know this. When you go back And you look at the Old Testament and we don't have time to do this in great detail this morning. But if you were to carefully go back and walk through the Old Testament, what you would see from Genesis 1 onward is that God desires that all people from every tribe, tongue, and nation would know him as the God of all creation. In fact, just think about it. In Genesis chapter 1, when God says, let us make man in our image. And then he says... Let them be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth. That was over the earth. Not just one particular location, but God wanted the people that he created to have dominion over the earth so that his image, are you following? So that his image might be spread throughout the earth. So from the beginning, God desired that this earth be full of image bearers that people made in the image of God would glorify God throughout the earth. Sin messed that up, but fast forward in the story. When you get to Genesis chapter 12, you remember the story, don't you? God comes to Abraham and tells Abraham what? I'm going to make you into a great nation, the nation of Israel, and through this nation, What did God tell Abraham? All the nations of the earth will be blessed. When God called Abraham, his Desire was for Abraham to be the seed of a nation that would bless every other nation. Think about when they were in Egyptian captivity for 400 years as slaves. Did you know this? That when the Hebrews came out of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea, did you know that it wasn't only Hebrews that crossed the Red Sea? Because while they were in Egypt, there were Egyptians that came to faith in the true God and they escaped Egypt with the Hebrew people. And so when the nation of Israel was formed in the wilderness, right, in the book of Exodus, it wasn't only ethnic Hebrew people who made up the nation of Israel. It was also Egyptians who came out with them. Why? Because God's desire has always been that his people will be far more than just one ethnic group. Or you think about this, you get to the book of Joshua. And in Joshua chapter two, there is a woman named Rahab, is there not, who identifies with the God of all creation and knows that the God of Israel is the true God. And so she is rescued out of Jericho. You think about Ruth, who is a Moabite woman. And you think about how how she identifies with the God of all creation. You think about Naaman, who who was a, a, a Gentile, who Elisha heals, and he identifies with the God of all creation. All that to say, when you read the Old Testament, it's very clear that God has a heart for all nations. You think about, right? You think about the book of Psalms. In Psalm 67, and in Psalm 67, David cries out, I want the nations to know of you. You think about Habakkuk 2.14, where the prophet prophesies about the glory of God covering the earth like the water covers the sea. You think about Zechariah 2.11, where the prophet talks about how there will be a day when all the nations will know God. All that to say, and I did that in four minutes, all that to say, when you read through the Old Testament carefully, what you come away with is 
is God's desire that all nations would know him. That's why church is so important, right? That we do the kinds of things that we continue to do in the life of our church, that, that we look around this city and we see the nations that are here and we minister through things like ESL or a Brazilian congregation or Hispanic congregation or however it is that God leads us to, to interact with this international community that's in our backyard or we continue to go to places like Japan or Indonesia or Russia or wherever else God sends us. We go because we know that God's desire is for the nations. Now watch this. Come on now, let me show you something else. We gotta go faster, but look at what it says. You come down. He says, I am sending you Verse 49, what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. And so listen, Jesus tells his disciples, you are my witnesses to the nations and you're not going, you are not going to witness to the nations alone. I am sending you what the father has promised. And you know what that is, the spirit of of God. We'll look at Acts chapter 2 next week on Easter Sunday and we'll see how the Spirit of God came to indwell His people for His glory and for His mission. Like that's the reality for you this morning. Come on now, wake up, listen, listen. Follower of Jesus, you have a clear call on your life to share the gospel, to make disciples of all nations, whatever that looks like in your life as God's at work in your life. And you've been given everything you need to do that. The spirit of God lives within you to do that. And so let me just stop here and help you to understand this real quick and we'll move forward. You can have real peace, but here's abundant life. Abundant life is understanding that you can have real peace purpose because that's what we all want. We all want real purpose. And so if I'm going to align myself with the purpose of God and the purpose of God that I live on his mission, wherever I am to the ends of the earth, then what I need now, watch this, is I need a new bucket list. Do you know what a bucket list is? Probably some of you have one. I've got mine. Like I want to go to the Grand Canyon and see the Grand Canyon, right? I got real close years ago to finishing my private pilot's license. I didn't get to finish it because lots of different factors. I want to get that done. Like I want to be a pilot someday and finish that up. Like I have a list of things that I want to accomplish. You do too. And maybe it's a traveling goal. Maybe it's a financial goal. Maybe it's an adventure you want to go on. I have no idea what's on your bucket list. But here's what I fear. That there will be a day that we stand before God and we've achieved the things on our bucket list, right? You saw the Grand Canyon. You got that private pilot's license. You did this, you did that. You checked things off your bucket list, but you didn't do the one thing that he left you on this earth to do. You see what I'm saying? Like I need a new bucket list. There's nothing wrong with doing some great things like going to the Grand Canyon or getting my private pilot's license. Like those are our noble goals, but that's not why God has left me here. I can enjoy those things, but that's not my purpose. What needs to be on my bucket list are my neighbors across the street. God help me to open my mouth to them and share the gospel with them. What needs to be on my bucket list, right? Are the internationals that live in this community coming in to this community like crazy, who need to know there's a God that loves them. What needs to be on my bucket list, right? Can we be so bold to say that what needs to be on my bucket list are those people groups that I consider enemies to the United States, right? What needs to be on my bucket list are, are those evil dictators that pray for them, that their hearts be changed. What needs to be on my bucket list are the 3.2 billion people who live in this world right now who have little to no access to the gospel. That needs to be on my bucket list. I pray for them and I ask God to show me how I can be a part of his mission that all people might know him. I'm just telling you, church, that, 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 that for many of us in this room, we've got the wrong bucket list. This is what I want to accomplish. No, the right bucket list is God, help me to live for your mission. Help me to see my neighbors the way that you see them. Help me to see the internationals around me in the way that you see them. Help me to see the world as you see it, right? Because the one thing that Jesus calls us to do before he leaves this earth, he calls us to be his witnesses. And now watch this. And I can't tell God, God, I can't. Now, I do that all the time. And so do you. 
You tell God, maybe it's not verbally, but by the way that you live before him, you do. God, I can't be a part of your mission because I can't talk to my neighbors because I'm scared. I can't go on that international mission trip because I don't have the time or the resources. I can't pray for that evil person because I just don't like him. I can't, I can't, I can't. The truth is, right? Like God has given you everything that you need so that you can say, I can His spirit lives within you and his spirit lives within you not to help you accomplish that dream of finally getting to see the Grand Canyon. You follow? His spirit lives within you, the text says, to empower you, to empower you for what church? To have a better day, right? To, to, you know, to accomplish all your goals, right? To what? No, the spirit empowers you for a specific purpose, his mission. And that, my friend, and for those of you who walk with the Spirit, you understand this. That's where the joy is found in living for that purpose. Abundant life is real peace. Abundant life is real purpose. An abundant life is real joy. Think about how the text ends. This is how the gospel of Luke ends. We're done. Look at what it says. 15 months to get to here. Look at what it says. Verse 50, then he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany. And and you understand where Bethany is, don't you? That's on the other side of Jerusalem near the Mount of Olives where Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus. So he's in that vicinity. He led them out to the vicinity of Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. That's wild. I don't know what that will look like, but all of a sudden Jesus is standing there and he starts lifting off. Isn't that crazy? Like if you go to Jerusalem, you can actually go to the church of the Ascension. I should have brought a picture of it, but I didn't think about it this morning. The church of the Ascension. So it's a church with no roof. Do you know why it has no roof? Because Jesus didn't need a roof. He just ascended up, right? And so, so you can go and, and in the ground at the church of the Ascension, they have a marked spot where the footprints of Jesus were. Isn't that wild? Now, I don't know if that's the real place, but at any rate, the, the point is that there in Bethany, something really happened. The resurrected Lord ascended. He lifted off. The disciples watched. Can you imagine the sight? They watched as Jesus began to lift up off the earth and rise up to heaven. And the question is, why? Like, that's so odd that Jesus would lift off and rise up to heaven? Why? Why? It's important, isn't it? Because the ascension of Jesus is a reminder to us that Jesus really is the exalted one. Where does he ascend to? He ascends, come on church, you know. He ascends to the right hand of the Father where he is now seated. You know, Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father is now doing what, church? Reigning and ruling. The one who sits at the right hand of the Father rules over this universe. He is in control. And this one, the king, who is at the right hand of the Father, who ascended to the heavens, is not only reigning and ruling, he is interceding for you. He's there on your behalf because of his death and resurrection. And I look at what the text says. After worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising God. Joy. The text says they returned with great joy. Why? Like Jesus just left them, but he didn't leave them alone. They had seen it. He really was alive. And now all of his promises were coming true and they weren't left alone. They knew, come on now, they knew the truth that everything that Jesus had done through his life, death and resurrection was for them. Oh, they thought, they thought that Jesus was gonna be this kind of Messiah that would come into Jerusalem and take a throne and beat up on Rome. But now they're getting it. No, it's far better. Jesus is the risen 
Savior, God of all creation, who's at the right hand of the Father, reigning and ruling not only over Jerusalem, but all of the universe. They return to Jerusalem with great joy. You see, come on now, abundant life. It's a life of peace. It's a life of purpose. It really is a life of joy. You can have real joy. Let me show you this and we're done. You have real joy because the king is calling the shots of your life. That's good news, my friend. Now, I know that we resist that. And I know that you and I are the kind of people that want to call the shots of our lives. But you also know this, that life is far better when Jesus reigns and rules. When Jesus calls the shots and you're submitted to him, like he really does know how to do a good work in your life. Like he really does know how to grow you in him. Like he really does know how to use you. Like he really does know how to bring you through your trials and tribulations for his glory and your good. Like it is a good thing that he calls the shots of your life. And you have joy because you have everything you need to live for his purpose. You are not left alone. The glorious reality of the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ is now that the spirit has come. You're not alone. The spirit of God is inside of you. He has taken up residence within you for his glory to use you for his purpose, right? And in those moments of, 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 of turmoil, in those moments of distress, in those moments of despair, you know it. He's present with you. Think about this. You have joy because Jesus has removed your despair. As hard as life may be, you know the end. And so you think about this glorious gospel that we've been in now for 15 months. What a way for it to end. Because the way the gospel of Luke ends is this reminder that abundant life, abundant life really is. Now, come on, come on, come on. I know you don't believe this sometimes, but it's true. Abundant life, it really is your reality right now because you have peace, you have purpose, and you have joy. And, and now here's the case. Oftentimes, life seems so miserable because you take your eyes off peace. You take your eyes off the purpose and you take eyes off the joy that Christ has given you. And so maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you're here this morning as a follower of Jesus and you are feeling that misery. It's not so abundant. And maybe this text is just a call to you, right? To let the peace of God reign over you. Maybe this text is a call to you to get back on the purpose that God has called you to, to get rid of your bucket list and live for his glory. Maybe this text is a call for you to be reminded of the joy that comes in knowing Christ and living for him. I don't know how the spirit of God is calling you to respond this morning, but I know that what the spirit of God desires for you is that you walk in the abundant life that Jesus has come to give you. Maybe you're in this room this morning and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. We have walked through Luke's gospel so that you might know that there's a God that loves you, loves you so much that he gave his son Jesus for you who died the death that you deserve and rose again from the dead three days later so all of your sins could be forgiven and you could be given the gift of life abundant and eternal. We've walked through Luke's gospel so you could see Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord who desires a relationship with you. And this morning, if you're in this room and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you've never repented of your sins and given your life to him today is the day to do so to believe the gospel to give your life to Jesus Christ this morning if you want to begin a relationship with Jesus I'll be standing down front and we'd love to talk to you about how you can begin a relationship with Jesus come down front let me pray with you and help you today enter into abundant life father thank you for this morning thank you for the incredible journey we've been on for the last um, 15 months walking through this beautiful gospel being reminded of the story of Jesus and what a precious story it is. To think about how Christ came, lived, died, and rose again so we can have hope, so we can have abundant life. Father, please help us to not settle for anything less than the abundant life that you've given us. Father, I pray for every person in this room, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, that we'll exchange misery for hope. We'll exchange misery for joy. We'll exchange misery for purpose. We'll exchange misery for peace. 
And Father, for that person in this room who has never placed his faith in you or her faith in you, I pray that person will come this morning repenting of their sins and giving their lives to you. And ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You rise to your feet as we have a time of invitation together. You come now as the Spirit of God leads you. Yeah. 